Hi everyone, welcome to Remote First. It's a bit of a shame we're not here in person this time around, but I'm sitting here with Kevin Friel and we'll talk to you today about how to secure and manage your IT operations for what is a completely distributed workforce, even before the current world circumstances. So I'm Lisa, I'm a security engineer. If you know me, you might realize that for a while, I've been gradually shifting my career over from systems engineering through to security. And I've so far been able to make that happen. And I've got Kevin sitting here on the call with me as well. So at all of our company meetings at Redox, one thing we do is we start with a moment of Zen. And what we do is we pause for a few seconds and think about something that makes us happy, something that we're thankful for and just be present in the moment. And particularly during these difficult times, I, I think that this is pretty important. So let's take a few moments. And this is something that makes me happy right before the flight and travel restrictions. I, I took a trip to Hawaii with my family. What we'll cover today is corporate security operations. Uh, that's my role. And we have a little bit of a distinction between the roles as you'd expect between systems and security. So I'm working on endpoint and SaaS tools. I do a lot of work with vulnerability management, particularly as it relates to endpoints and new job functions that I didn't previously have when I was a systems engineer include participating in a risk register to identify what our risks are and how serious they might be to the organization if they were to eventuate. I work on the hardening and baselines and unfortunately, occasionally incident response. So some of the things Kevin will will do for his role and cover today is around the assets in the inventory. Having a strong asset management system is pretty important for any organization. He's doing most of the endpoint management work. And for us, that, that's Jeff, but there's so many tools out there. That might actually be something pretty interesting to talk about um, after our session's done, if anyone has time to stick around. And one thing that is working really well for us is that we have a partnership between IT and security. And this actually helps us get our work done pretty well. I have been, unfortunately, in situations in the past where there was less of a partnership and more of an antagonistic um, role. But by working together, I think we're able to do quite a lot for our organization. So some of the things that I'm going to cover today uh, the distributed security challenges. As mentioned, even before the current world situation, we were remote. Uh, that includes compliance, uh, both for a company level and our endpoints, vulnerabilities, which are literally the bane of my existence. Uh, we'll go a little bit on malware and threats, and we'll talk about some of the work we've been doing with Splunk and how we're getting that data into Splunk using our Splunk data to make both of our roles a bit easier. I'll be going over some of the challenges that we have to lean heavily into um, Apple best practices, um, touch on a lot of the security tools that Lisa's going to mention, and then how we get to all tie that together with Splunk. I'll start us off with what we do with corporate security operations. And I just want to admit that I actually really struggled to prepare this, this session it was a really difficult balance between going too deep, too shallow, and only 30 minutes between us. What am I, what am I going to cover uh, that's relevant? So I'm not going to waste more of our time. And I'll go through some of the tools that we're using to achieve our team's security goals. I do want to note that there are so many tools out there, different vendors, open source, paid, that what's working for us might not be a good fit for other organizations, depending on their requirements. And again, if people have time to hang around afterwards, I think that's a pretty interesting conversation we can have, find out what's working, what doesn't, um, and some of the processes that, that you're using to help each other out. We have a number of challenges being distributed. This is a map I pulled from Splunk recently that shows most of our employees' locations. I couldn't fit Hawaii onto the slide. I'm a little jealous of the person that gets to work there. We do have a small headquarters, which is in Madison, Wisconsin. You can see that is the largest dot, I think, or not the best at geography. Uh, so prior to the pandemic, everyone was remote. Just a few people occasionally went into that office. I mean, we, ha we do have to get mail and have a physical address, but now absolutely everybody is remote. 
That means that some of the infrastructure that you might take for granted for corporate security observability, we, we just don't have. We don't have the traditional network that we can uh, pull logs from. We, we don't have that central firewall. And that makes my job a little bit more difficult about trying to meet our security requirements, observability. And yet what's also really important for us is that we don't hinder our employees. We don't want to make their lives miserable. We don't want to slow their devices down as well. The way we think of it is each person's device is their own perimeter. So every desk, um, every coffee shop, when we're hopefully able to travel again, the airport lounges, hotel rooms, uh, each person's personal home network is its own network and its own perimeter. And so that then becomes each company device. So some of those security controls that might typically be at an office network level are now applied at the device level. Compliance is something that's extremely important for Redox. We are in the healthcare space and just because we're remote, we, we don't get that free pass. We have to meet both industry compliance standards. And then we also have another set of internal standards that must be applied to both our endpoints and our employees. We still, however, need to be able to do all the things that you do with a traditional face-to-face -face model, which is deploy and issue devices, provide support when people have problems, uh, monitor, remediate what's going on and be able to report. For us, that means that we have an internal baseline for security configurations and standards. So we have an application list of those apps that we support and considered mandatory. And we still have timelines for resolving device compliance. Now, most of that we do through automation, but we also have a strong company policy to support what actions that we are doing. Now that we're moving on to endpoint management on identity, I'm not going to talk too much on this. I don't want to steal any of Kevin's thunder. Uh, being so remote and distributed, the legacy identity management uh, just isn't necessarily going to fit us. So a legacy model of domain controllers with on-prem infrastructure won't work. So we need to use cloud-based solutions. And what's working for us for now is both Janth and Octo, and I'll let Kevin speak in more detail about these. With my role, vulnerabilities, as mentioned, it's, it's just the bane of my existence. I am constantly playing cat and mouse trying to keep up with these. As soon as we get rid of the current set, there's always another zero day somewhere or another finding in the scan results. So this is really important, but it's also one of the more frustrating parts because it's something that's never going to be completed. We're not able to scan a network and to find out what might be present or if there's a deviation on a device, that means that I do have to use a vulnerability scanning agent. And as said, that just keeps going and going. So like all of you, I don't want to be burdening these devices with agents, but that's one thing that I, I do think is needed for this particular tool. Tunnable is working for us quite well at the moment. Uh, it does have an agent and what it what is nice about that agent is that it sends all the results through to a, a cloud console. And then it leaves me with a list of vulnerabilities ranked by criticality. So that's now become my to-do list. Uh, Kevin and I, we then need to action those across the fleet, which we do as part of our, our patching process. And that way we're able to get visibility into app vulnerabilities, but also some of the configuration vulnerabilities. And where this is really helpful is that it finds some of the things that our other tools won't give us visibility to. And then when it does come around to audit C then, with our Tenable console, we're able to show that we've been actioning our vulnerabilities in a timely manner, and we've got the history of everything that we've addressed. With malware and threats, I know that antivirus is a point of contention in our community and occasional debate. Firstly, because we are in healthcare, it's not optional and it's something that we're required to do. But all of that aside, my, my two cents is we do still need one. There are findings that do manage to get past Gatekeeper. Gatekeeper is great, but whilst there's still things that are skipping through, we still need this. It does also come down to tool choice. A good 
tool is going to do a lot more than just look for signature-based attacks. So we're using Sentinel-1, and it does a lot more than that. One of the features that the security team really find helpful is the deep visibility. It gives us insight into the actual event and process level of what's going on on the device. So we're able to do things like query URLs that a device has visited, uh, DNS requests. And another thing that's really helpful is that it makes use of the MITRE attack uh, framework for identifying suspicious events and behavior that might not yet have a definition. So for us, that value add gives us a lot more observability and a bit of peace of mind that is of more value than just ticking that checkbox that needs to be seen. Yep, we got a virus, any virus tool. We also need to put a lot of effort into our event monitoring. And again, Command Report is doing a good job for that with us. It's pretty lightweight and not visible to most end users. And it gives that level of observability into the events that are happening. And if unfortunately it does happen, we have the data we need for an endpoint investigation. I've just shown us a few of the consoles and tools uh, that we're using to run our security program. But now we've got a burn, we've got all these different places we have to look to do the, to the work that we have to get done. That's when Splunk has come into play for us. We're able to collect and aggregate on that data and search across the different data sources and events for visibility. Getting the data into Splunk is a bit easier than you might think. There's a number of add-ons that are already available in Splunk base. Uh, this little screenshot here over on the right is some of the fields that are coming in with the Jamf add-on, but most probably you'll find whatever tools you use is already an add-on to simplify the collection available. There's actually more than 100 plus fields in addition to these, but this will give you some idea of the level of granularity that we have. As the data comes in, Splunk passes through all of the events, extracts, and then um, assigns to the fields for querying. How we use Splunk is, in my role, a lot about compliance uh, for our endpoints. So this is one of the dashboards we have. I want all of these numbers to be zero. I know that that's not not going to happen, but I want to see it as close to zero as I can. Uh, we can use that for endpoint compliance. We can alert on events that are problematic. And we also have the historical data that allows us to have insights into how the state of the fleet is changing or any investigation for something that might have occurred in the past. I'm going to show you a few simple Splunk queries. Uh, don't worry about scribbling these down. We're, we're, go we're going to share this uh, after if it helps anybody. So one query that might be useful for a DLP perspective is Max that have sent data with Dropbox. And this way you can see what's happening. Maybe Dropbox is not in your corporate tool set. Maybe it is, but you can do similar queries with the command reporter index. Another example we have is failed Okta authentications. Uh, for the most part, they're probably going to be somebody making a mistake on their password, or maybe they were too slow getting that MFA response done. But you can also look at that from a geo perspective. If you're getting a lot of failed Okta authentications, maybe in a region, parts of Europe, or maybe Africa, where you don't have employees, a chance that that might be some sort of attack attempt. Um, if it's where you expect, and then there's a successful authentication shortly after, then probably it's one of the previously mentioned scenarios. Being able to see the location of your company endpoints is really helpful. We do have requirements that some systems and tools are not accessed out of the US. So although you can have technical controls, it's also helpful to be able to see where your company's devices most likely are. And this one, again, being in my existence, getting that vulnerability list and then turning it into a pie chart uh, so I can see where we're at uh, from all of those scan results. So I hope this was interesting. I'll let Kevin talk a bit about our IT operations work and how we're doing those tasks as a remote organization. Thank you, Lisa. Um, first thing I want to say is we're very fortunate that at our company, we're able to have a very tight integration between IT operations and security operations. And I think that a lot of what we're doing would only be possible because of that. 
Um, I'm sure everybody's worked in somewhere where they, that might not have been the case. And we're lucky that that is for us. So what is it that we do? Well, the first thing we wanna talk about is uh, the challenges that we have as a distributed workforce. So basically the role of IT is the same, you know, but how we go about doing it has to be quite different. Um, instead of having one central location or you know, a number of offices um, with dedicated IT staff, we literally have over 150 offices. You know, every person is their own office because we work distributed. And so that means that they have to share me as the IT staff. So there is no desk for somebody to walk up to if they have a problem. Um, there is nobody to hand out a Mac on day one, you know, but luckily we have the management and security tools um, to do that. And they're the security tools are fairly um, location agnostic. So how can we do this? Well, we're an Apple shop. So that means that we use Macs for our workforce. And so we're able to lean heavily on Apple best practices and we really do. So Apple has solutions for deploying hardware. They have solutions for provisioning software. Um, they have solutions for securing endpoints. There's third party management solutions and patching solutions. But that doesn't really get us everywhere. We still have a lot of other challenges. You know, um, what do we do about break fixes? What do we do about troubleshooting? Um, what about those common or random questions that people tend to have um, that you know they would typically walk up to their IT person that they, they trust? Well, we need more tools. Um, so we continue to leverage the Apple best practices and we start to add some tools of our own. Um, the IT toolkit is a little bit different for our remote. So first, let's do the Apple best practice. Um, we truly embrace a true zero touch deployment. And what I mean by that is we order a Mac for every new employee as needed. We direct ship that Mac to the employee's house. Um, they're securely enrolled into DEP or um, what you'd like to call it. Um, I know Apple keeps changing. Um, MDM does the rest. And then of course, you know, we get to have profit from that. Um, other than a small pool of loaners, we don't maintain any stock. So we order pretty much one to one and distribute it as needed. Um, direct shipped, like I said, it all goes directly to the employee. And luckily we have the EP to sort of help us with that. The other thing that's important to note is we're able to maintain a chain of custody um, from Apple to employee, technically Apple to FedEx to employee. Um, and because we require a secure enrollment, um, if that does get taken somewhere in the middle, um, we don't really have to worry about that. We can ensure that only Okta authorization um, allows the right person to enroll and log in. Um, and then as I alluded to earlier, we sort of have this alphabet soup of uh, that Apple's given us, you know, DEP, MDM, VPP, you know, we can get lost in all those letters, but the end result is a fairly efficient and secure process that allows our IT to reach into that Mac virtually and set it up. And to the end user, it pretty much just works. Um, right? <laughs> um, that's great for getting it set up and getting going on day one. But there's always a little bit more to it than that. So this is where we have to do a lot more planning and change things up as opposed to a traditional IT. Um, but it's also where it gets fun. So we totally get to rethink how we do IT. We need to do this to ensure that we can give the same or even better experience for all of our users, no matter where they are, literally in the world. Um, we go through this list of kind of what it means to me to have uh, remote IT. So we fully embrace the lack of a central IT desk. Um, I kind of hate to say it, but hashtag remote. Um, we need to anticipate what our users need. Um, and then we have to figure out a way to make asking for help as easy as walking up to a you know, their IT person's desk and self-service, self-service, self-service. Um, again, that all sounds great, um, but how do we do that? Well, again, it's all about the tools. And so this is where we change things up a little bit. Um, 
Two or three of those tools are kind of obvious on the IT side. You know, we take advantage of Apple processes and, of course, management tools um, you know, for MDM, uh, which in our case, we use Jamf. Um, and even reporting is kind of a part of IT, depending on your organization. But IT leveraging security tools, um, it's usually just responsible for you know, deploying and then, of course, trying to fix unruly security agents um, or reporting things back to uh, the security teams, not actually taking advantage of those security tools um, and the information they collect. So that's kind of where we change up a little bit. So again, Apple, thanks to MDM, um, you know, the device management is the IT team. And since our security team is already doing their jobs well, thank you, Lisa, um, we can take advantage of their security and reporting tools. So in traditional IT, each of these four tool sets could be completely separate or lightly integrated, like I said. But in our distributed IT model, we're taking advantage of our device management tools and tying it into the other tool sets. And IT gets to look good doing it. So we don't do all the work to set it up, but we have to take a lot of the advantage of those others. So in our case, like I said, we use Jamf. Um, it gives us a good mix of MDM and agent management, at least while we can still use the management and Apple allows it. So we get to use Jamf as it's designed, but it's also tied into a much larger picture. So Jamf has even started to promote itself in this way as Jamf and in their marketing and stuff. So basically choose the best tool for the job and tie it into Jamf and, or have Jamf tie into that tool. Um, this isn't meant to be a promotion for Jamf. Uh, it's just that I've been using it for about 10 years and the product's improved and it's proved itself. So it's not perfect, um, but it, it's a, it does its job really well and it does actually play pretty well with others. And in a distributed IT model, that's super important. Um, there's no single tool that can do it all. Um, there is no single pane of glass. And I know a lot of IT leadership likes to hope for. Um, however, it's possible to get everything we need through a curated list of tools. And funny enough, a lot of those tools that help us happen to be security tools. So each gets to do their designated jobs, but when they're all tied together with Splunk, things start to get kind of interesting. So of course, Jamf collects all the data about the Macs enrolled. Um, and you can see kind of what Jamf does. Um, some of that data may be collected by other tools. So there is some overlap, but actually not a lot of overlap. Um, and, you know, of course, we get the no touch management thing, and that's one of its big strengths. But now we have the full set of tools, each doing what they do best, but also that they collect a lot of data. So we can start to merge and collate that data to get some meaningful device data. Um, but again, that's not the end of the discussion, uh, particularly with the distributed workforce. We also have to ensure our user experience, both uh, with using their Macs, but also if something goes wrong or they have questions. Being distributed, we need to worry about our users uh, being able to easily communicate with IT. Uh, for us, that's Slack and Zoom, um, and it works really well for us. Um, you can have the best laid plans. Um, you can teach your users the right things to do. But if your users can't easily communicate with IT, then you fail. And being distributed adds to a lot of those challenges. Um, again, hashtag remote. <laughs> um, that's really the focus. Um, we need to anticipate by using the data from all the tools at our disposal. Um, we leverage those communication tools to make asking for help as easy as walking up to the IT person's desk. And for some people, maybe even easier. Um, and this is a constant evolution. And of course, it's going to depend on your company culture, you know, how deeply you can go on any one of these things. But most importantly, we think that empowering your users with self-service is, is really the big thing. And a lot of this kind of hides behind that self-service. Next level IT is about having a single source of truth collated from many sources. So this is really just kind of tying it all together. It sounds like I'm repeating myself because I keep saying a lot of things over again, but the vision is to use best in class tools for their intended purpose. Uh, but also by leveraging a tool like Splunk to collect and collate all that data and look for meaningful information. You know, no tool will give you a complete picture of an endpoint, but add them all together and you get something useful. So at this point, you're probably expecting, you know, um, some amazing dashboards or some formulas to, uh, to build some stuff, but we're not quite there yet. Um, we have the architecture in place, so to speak, um, to figure most of this out. And we're in the process of figuring a lot of it out. 
but we're still in the seeing how it all plays together. Um, this is, you know, we're considering this our discovery phase. We figured out what we can collect. Now we're looking at how to best use that to our advantage, particularly in the case of distributed workforce when IT doesn't have physical access to an endpoint. So discovering common usage issues from the aggregated data sources, taking advantage of that data collection for troubleshooting. And that's going to be the big thing right there. Um, tied into figuring out the best way to handle local the Mac the local Mac OS logs. And then using all that data to create really meaningful self-service tools. So the next time we speak, we'll have a lot more to show you about how we've tied all these things together and how our end, end users are enjoying it. But at this point, I think we're going to um, go for questions. Um, before we go, we have some of the resources and, of course, some credits. Um, and again, I'd like to thank Lisa for being part of the team. It's really, I can't stress enough how important it is for security and IT to work together to make a lot of this possible. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. I hope that there was at least something to take away. And we're happy to connect with anyone on LinkedIn. And we'll hang around for a bit and uh, have a discussion if uh, anyone would like to chat with us. But we'd also be interested to hear what uh, you all use as well for these problems.